I just returned from Hong Kong where I attended the 15th Sakyadita International Conference on Buddhist Women, which was just wonderfully inspiring, empowering to me personally. And one of the things that was, it was um, maybe an insight, maybe an aha moment, but somewhere during the course of the presentations, there were about 52 presentations by both Buddhist laywomen and monastics, is that I came very, even more deeply to understand that when the Buddha Dharma, when the monastic community and lay practitioners are in a society for any period of time. And in Asia, like in Taiwan and Korea, it's been in these countries for hundreds of years, thousands of years, that when they are practicing and growing and thriving and educating themselves, that their contribution to that society is extraordinary. So to really see how the Buddha Dharma and the Sangha can really contribute to the well-being of a culture, of a country, of a society, was very apparent in some of the presentations by some of the, the Buddhist uh, women, and particularly the bhikshunis. And I wanted to share with you one presentation that went so <laughs> deeply into my heart when the bhikshunis shared it, um, that I wanted to share it with you on how this is very true. Now, we're not quite sure because the Buddha Dharma and the Sangha are fairly new in the West, what it's going to actually look like, let's say, three or four hundred, a thousand years from now. But knowing that the benefiting others is a core part of the practice, it will be wonderful to see how it manifests. But I want to share this one. So her name was Bhikshuni Zizhao Shi. And her uh, presentation was Empowering the Dreams of the Poor through transdisciplinary cooperation. She had a PowerPoint with photos, which I also appreciated. Um, and even though it, they didn't have it in her, um, her little blurb in the back, in the paper they kept mentioning the Luminary Research Institute or the Luminary Female Buddhist Monastic Community. So I'm going to make an assumption that this is Luminary Temple that she is a member of, and her last name is she. So she was part of a, um, a symposium, the Luminary Research Institute, a female Buddhist community, launched a project basically to tackle some of the difficult social prog uh, programs and uh, problems in Taiwan. They have had a lot of um, gaps becoming, as in a lot of, you know, industrialized, progressive countries, there becomes this disconnect between the rural poor and the urban educational people. There's a digital divide that they wanted to address, and there's a high unemployment among youth in certain areas of Taiwan. So this research institute wanted to find some sort of project that they could do, and it was three big shunis to start, on how they could endeavor to do something to benefit Taiwan. So they ended up having um, a symposium, and in the symposium they invited scholars, psychologists, artists, engineers, people in technology to meet and address these three particular issues. And so they had five of these institutions sign on with sort of a, a promise or a memorandum to participate. What they found is that there was a, an elementary middle school, and I don't know where in Taiwan it was, it was called Mei Wa, that was face, facing closure because of the decreasing numbers of students. A lot of the kids were leaving. Some of them weren't even going to school. They were going to urban areas to get better jobs, to find spouses, and so forth. And so a lot of the fields, the, which was rice was the main agricultural uh, occupation there, they were being basically left abandoned. And so the whole economy of the area around this school started to decline. There was a high unemployment, and there was just a lot of difficulty starting to arise. And the kids struggled with low self-esteem and hopeless, hopelessness, and there was uh, a difficulty of drug-taking, things like that were starting to happen. Alcohol was being introduced into the culture. 
Also, they found out that a lot of Southeast Asian women came to this part of Taiwan, and they were married Taiwanese men, but they weren't very facile with the languages. So then it became yet another barrier for these young mothers to try to communicate with the local Taiwanese communities when they didn't have the language, and so there were some difficulties there. Um, the other thing that became apparent to the Bikshunis and the folks who decided to take this school on board was that there was also a lot of distrust between the teachers and the students. There was just a lot. There was truancy.、Uh, there was a lack of respect for the teachers. There was just a lot of tension between the teachers and the students. So the nuns from Luminary developed a three-stage project. The first one was to empower the youth in the community and to try to improve the financial situation. They saw very soon after they got to the school that there was a struggle between the negative mindset of the teachers and the, and the students. And it's one of those common occurrences where the teachers have got a lot of pressure to do a curriculum, and then you have these students that have all different types of capacities of learning. Some of them don't do very well with the required curriculum, and then of course you've got a lot of difficulties, behavior problems in the classrooms. So what they wanted to do, they opened two classes. One was an art class, and one was a mindful tutoring class. And one of the ways they wanted to connect with the kids is that they offered a painting and drawing class where the kids would paint and draw aspects of their lives. Their families, whether it were the families did for a living, their whole kind of internal, external life, and annually, what they would, what they did is they found a. She was called、uh, the barefoot artist, Lily Ye, and what she did over a course of six months, the kids put together quite a collection of these paintings of all different types of medium. She took those paintings and she transposed them into a huge 30-foot mural on one of the walls of the of the school, with all of their beautiful pictures on a tree with these spinning tops, with their little vignettes of their lives in this beautiful mural. I mean, the photograph of it was stunning. She also put together a five-foot gyro. A metal top in the middle of the public square in the school, and also covered that with stories of their lives. This、uh, community was one of the first、uh, economically viable communities in Taiwan. It was quite old, almost a thousand years old. So they wanted to bring also the historical、um, timeline of the the history of the town itself. So that was also put into the artwork, and then they had a beautiful sort of a tile labyrinth in which this. Gyro sat, so for the kids to see their work and their lives put in this beautiful sort of recognition kind of display, it really gave them a sense of confidence, a, a sense of that they could do something and accomplish something, and that what that their lives had meaning and that people really appreciated it. The other thing that they integrated with this, because they wanted to have somewhat of a spiritual component, is they added mindful tutoring, which included mindfulness meditation. They would help the kids after school with tutoring, problem solving, and they would also do compassion practice. They uh, incorporated uh, mindful eating, walking, sitting,、uh, compassionate listening. And at the end of the day, they get got together with them. I think twice a week. At the end of the class and this meditation, they would do a sharing time where they would the kids would take turns sharing what they appreciated, either in each other or something that had happened at school or something that had happened in their families. And what they also the big shunies and the volunteers also began to notice that it alleviated a lot of tension between the students and the teachers. The teachers under the pressure to follow these strict curriculums. A lot of the kids were ignored. A lot of their problems weren't addressed. After a while, the relationships changed, and the kids were a lot more respectful, a lot more、um, receptive to the teachers. And as a result, the teachers were much more respectful, and also kind, and and more engaged with the students.、Um, the long-term project. Uh, for this institute was to help the residents of the community identify and reclaim their heritage of,、uh, as one of the earliest Taiwanese developed towns. So they ended up doing these beautiful pathways through the community, where they had some old buildings, they had some old agricultural indications of what might have been happening five or six hundred years prior in that community. 
and it was to make Meihua into an educational park where visitors could come and see the art projects, walk along the ancient paths, hundreds of years old, and study the history of early Taiwan. So this also became also a source of financial stability. The tourists came, they had little shops, they had little restaurants. And so it started to bring the whole financial situation of the community up. And then the last stage was that they wanted to bring life skill training to the entire town, whether you were a mom, whether you were a student, whether you were a teacher, whether you were a volunteer, even the neighboring communities. They started having filmmaking courses, cooking, art, handicrafts, all facilitated by the volunteers and the bhikshunis from the temple. They invited scholars, experts in the field to share their expertise. And so many of the volunteers... Um, directed and facilitated the projects, and it really increased, they said that the warmth and the connectedness of not just the community at Meihua, but the surrounding communities, just the whole shift on, on how that area just sort of rose to the occasion and felt really empowered. And so it was, after I saw this presentation, it was like, here's this incredible bodhicitta you know, kindness, compassion, motivation that these bhikshunis... Now, I don't know how long they had been ordained. They didn't talk too much about how they were able to leave the temple and go away and do these things. The school must have been close enough where they weren't traveling far. But to see that with the, the compassion thinking, with the empowering of people, of them really practicing what monastic life to really empower sentient beings to be able to invite the good qualities of not just the children but the teachers the parents it was just like throwing a little stone into a pond and having this thing just ripple out and this took not very long it was about a it was five years ago i think it was about a two two-year project this whole thing kind of took off now where it is now i i don't know i would love to to follow this through. But I was really inspired on how the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha could really help in sort of common mundane terms, but to integrate deeply into the hearts of these children in the community this long-term vision of ethical conduct, compassion, loving kindness, and how that's going to affect not just the, the present community, but it will then become the transmission into the future generations, and that the Dharma will be integrated in a way where people can meet it, skillful means, and then the bhikshunis have also made a connection to this wonderful community, and vice versa, that the community has made a connection to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So I was very empowered by the, the presentation uh, and the uh, enthusiasm and the success and the, uh, that it bore fruit for the community at large.